recent developments of Japan and the assassination of uh, Prime Minister Abe have been a very uh, serious incident that has actually exposed some of the real issues in Japanese history, not just Abe, but the past history of, of the Japanese government and political parties in Japan. This is an important issue which most Americans are unfamiliar with. So joining us today, Alexis Duddens. She is a professor at the University of Connecticut and has been studying the history of Japan and in particular, the role of Abe and the LDP. Uh, so welcome to our show. Thank you so much for including me in your conversation. So Alexi, for those who, who don't know about uh, Prime Minister Abe and his history, maybe you can talk to us about that history and, and its relevance today. Sure. So Prime Minister Abe is a, an extremely important individual. Uh, he is not one of the greatest leaders of the 20th or 21st centuries as he's being portrayed. He is, however, Washington's helpful person in Tokyo. He is somebody who is a privilege, uh, you know, he's honestly, he's kind of like the leader of North Korea. He is a spoiled rich kid who has his job because so did his grandfather. And he has that job and he has held on to that job. The assassination is what is really interesting for Japanese society. And his grandfather, Ishii, who was he and why he is important and what his relationship was to the United States? Sure. So Kishi Nobusuke uh, was the creator of what is uh, known as, it's now North China. In, in the 1930s and 40s, it was a, a colony of Japan. Um, and Kishi Nobusuke created the industrial base there. And I mean, was a really brilliant uh, thinker engineer in terms of how this worked out. He was then classified by the United States as a class A war criminal. Uh, he was not hanged. Um, and uh, then he became prime minister because of the way the United States worked out its settlement of Japan incidents. Um, but Abe had to live with this his whole life. And so, you know, when we think about this, especially as Americans right now with incredibly divisive politics here, are you responsible for the beliefs of your grandfather? Yes, no, I'm not. Uh, my grandfather was an imperialist. Uh, I say that openly. If you don't say that openly, then okay. Uh, and Kishi was an imperialist, and he was really good at it, and Abe wants to whitewash that. And this history, the United States was, of course, in charge of Japan after the Second World War, uh, a military regime. He was uh, classified a war criminal. Why did the United States bring him back and allow him uh, to become a powerful figure again in Japan? That's an excellent question and something that the United States and Great Britain disagreed with profoundly. Uh, so Great Britain wanted a lot of these uh, people held accountable. Uh, the United States immediately wanted an anti-communist arc. And so when we look at Japan for the last 50, 70 years, it's America's uh, bulwark, as it was called, uh, against communism. And basically, we have a giant aircraft carrier in the Pacific, and it's called Japan. And uh, Abe's grandfather went with it, even though his own personal writings disagreed with it. He, no, uh, Kishi Nobusuke was profoundly anti-American and disagreed with the terms of the Americans surrender which uh, a different politician, and I'm not getting into the details here, but a different politician disagreed with. So that's what's coming to the fore right now. And what's fascinating to me is Japanese people are now beginning to pay attention to these disagreements. And Abe was involved with not just the Moonies, and maybe we can talk about that, this, uh, his, uh, his assassin, but also other right-wing religious sects in Japan. Well, let's start with the Moonies. This, uh, 
<laughs> right. I mean, the Boonies actually uh, Unification Church are in the United States, and I understand uh, also they were training Japanese uh, in the United States to learn English and then go back to Japan to work as secretaries for members of parliament in, in Japan. Is that true? Yes. Uh, what is exceptionally helpful to the conversation within Japan right now, and I would express this because uh, Japan is a wonderfully open civil society, and most Japanese do not agree with Prime Minister, former dead Prime Minister Abe's views. But most prime, most people in Japan had no clue. And now there is this thing called the internet, and now they know. So, uh, yeah, the Moonies. Um, yeah, so the Moonies uh, got in touch with Abe's grandfather's best friend, Mr. Sasakawa, also a Class A war criminal. And Mr. Sasakawa, this is early 1960s, and Mr. Sasakawa, who is also a Class A war criminal and also uh, is wildly powerful and rich in, in terms of his legacy, uh, brought the Moonies in. And these are people for whom anti-communism was the term. So anything anti-communist, and this is where we have a wild, wild irony right now. Japan and South Korea are not talking to one another, and yet their deep, deep roots are extremely anti-communist, and they're anti-communist with this church that believes in, we're not really sure what, but we know in the United States what it looks like. And Japanese people are just learning this right now. South Koreans are also just learning this right now. And there's a lot of catch up to do. And one of the issues about the relationship of the LDP to the Unification Church and, and Abe was that this church in Japan apparently was coercing its adherents to give money uh, to the church, which was then sent to K South Korea and were engaged, according to lawyers, for some of these adherents who became angry and disgruntled, was being covered up by the Japanese government. Is that true? Absolutely. And this is where this incident to me, and forgive me, I really don't know enough yet, but as a historian, this looks a lot like the 1995 Alm Shinriko uh, Sarin incident in the subway, uh, in which people in Japan who are preyed upon by cults uh, give money. And so what we know from the uh, the suspect or the alleged assassin's story is that his mom gave almost one million US dollars. And it's because she felt no place in Japanese society. And that's where the story really exists for a lot of my colleagues in Japan. I mean, yes, it's wrong at all costs. It, violence is wrong. Assassination is wrong. Uh, the way Abe died is wrong. What's interesting for most of my colleagues in Japan is what drove the, the suspect in the story is uh, because he was pissed that his mom gave away the family money and she gave away a million dollars and he didn't get to go to college because of that and she didn't get to go he didn't get to go to college because his mom didn't feel a place because you know for all these reasons but that's japan and then he joins the self defense forces which is exceptionally interesting right now because japan wants to strengthen its borders wants self defense forces so you get abe who is the strongest advocate of Japan's strong borders is killed by somebody who's learned how to strengthen the borders. And the LDP has been actively trying in Abe particularly to change the Article 9, or uh, which in the Japanese constitution, which prohibits offensive war. Why don't you talk about the efforts to remilitarize Japan and what would it mean to 
uh, Japan if that happened? Sure. And uh, so what's really important to understand from the beginning is Article 9 never prohibits Japan from self-defense. And it's something we all should think about right now, especially with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, Japan has the British hate hearing this statistic, but the, uh, Japan has the second best Navy in the world. And that's built by the United States. Uh, Japan has an astonishingly competent army, it, 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 all of this. And let's look at the guy who just killed Abe, somebody who had had weapons training. He knew how to build a weapon. Uh, and sorry, small diversion there. But so uh, Article 9 prohibits Japan, Japan from waging war abroad but it does not prohibit Japan from protecting Japan. And what's happened in the last seven years has been under former Prime Minister Abe, uh, a desire for Japan to change that little description and have Japan be allowed to wage war abroad. Most Japanese do not at all agree with that. And that's the key takeaway is Article 9 is at the beginning of the Constitution an American definition, no war. And then it became, since 1947, when the Constitution went into effect, part of Japanese society. And today, most Japanese believe that they should not be bombed from abroad or invaded, but they also believe that they do not have to help the United States wage war abroad. And that's the huge gap that we're talking about. And there was a really important statistic done by the Asahi Shimbun in May 2015. I think it was May 2015. Um, that, uh, you know, so do you believe in Japan self defense? Do you believe in uh, Japan having the ability to have weapons? Do you believe in Japan waging war abroad? An overwhelming majority of Japanese said, of course, we should be able to defend Japan. 4% of Japanese said, no, we're not fighting American wars abroad. And this effort, the Asian pivot that uh, both the Democrats and Republicans are pushing now for rearmament of uh, Asia to surround China, it seems like the Abe uh, administration or, uh, previously and the LDP government are believe that that is something that they should be part of. I know that Nakasone, former Prime Minister Nakasone, you were referring to aircraft carriers, said that uh, he thought that Japan should be an aircraft carrier for the United States. This remilitarization Japan, what would that mean in Japan and internationally? Well, o Okinawa is target number one. And that's why we look at Okinawa, because Okinawans do not want to be target number one. And uh, their governor, Denny Tamaki, is really clear about this. He welcomes the United States military's presence. He does not welcome a forward base. And so there's a really important thing. If anything, the United States can learn is what is the difference between offense and defense? And Japan does not want to be targeted. Most Japanese people respect that they're sitting there and China's growing and North Korea is throwing missiles over their heads, but Japan does not want to invade other countries. Former Prime Minister Abe had this fantasy land in so far that he thought, oh, yeah, we can do whatever. But most Japanese don't want that. And the uh, U.S. military defense treaty between Japan and the United States precluded uh, nuclear weapons in uh, Japan, but apparently nuclear weapons were brought into Okinawa. Was there a violation of this agreement even by the United States? Oh, yeah. And that's on the books, and that's available for anybody who likes FOIA declarations. Yeah, no, I mean, we've got nukes in Japan, we've got nukes in South Korea, we have them wherever we want, because we do, as the US, whatever we want. Uh, what's interesting is Japanese now know about this. And so the first 
I would say, and this happened before Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, last January, former Prime Minister Abe suggested that Japan should become nuclear, like, you know, like we should have nukes. And current Prime Minister Kishida, who does not have the street cred that Abe does, said, no, not so much. And Kishida is from Hiroshima. And I think this is something that people should learn more about. And I wish I knew more about. And I wish I knew more about uh, Prime Minister Kishida. But I think if you're born in Hiroshima and you know what it means to grow up in a city bombed by the United States with a weapon that ends time, you know that it's probably not a good weapon. And I think that is the only thing to hope on to. It's not really an expression, but I think I'm going to grab on to maybe Kishida understands Japan does not need to go nuclear. And the introduction of uh, nuclear power in Japan was uh, by uh, Ronald Reagan and others who said that uh, peaceful, they were peaceful at him, that this was a peaceful thing. Um, and Japan now, they wanted to build actually nuclear plants all along the coast of California but there were mass protests here in Japan. Just, they were. I was, I'm just interrupting you because I was in Fukushima a week ago, literally, <laughs> like I was there. There's no, like, and you know what? Everybody I spoke with, people I've spoken with for the last 10 years, yes, this is a very complicated question, right? Because we're all, there's like, what counts as energy? Uh, the problem with nuclear energy is human beings are involved, right? And so it's like communism. Uh, somebody's going to do something wrong, and it all goes to pot, as it were. And so uh, Fukushima is a dead zone. And well, according to uh, former Prime Minister Abe, uh, it had been decontaminated, and he told the uh, Olympic International Committee, there was no problem there and everything had been taken care of. Right. So I was there last week. That's not true, according to the people who live there and according to every photograph I took. And what did you find there when you when you visited? Um, well, I got turned around at several roads that were not allowed to be accessed. I actually, the thing that if if I start to cry, the thing that upsets me the most was seeing beautiful farmland that's not allowed to be grown or fallow. I mean, because it's dead and it's been declared no. And so there are 100,000 people who have been declared unimportant to Japan. And you know what? That's how, you know, are we supposed to look at this as historians and say that's how life works, 100,000 people, who cares? Yeah, but, you know, when you look at their lives and then you look at the rest of Japan and rice is growing and it's beautiful and it's spring and it's green. Yeah, but Fukushima is, there's a central part, it's called Itate, and it is gorgeous and it's dead because of Fukushima. On, I was there and, and actually interviewed an LDP politician in uh, Sendai, Sendai when uh, during a previous election, and he was saying, I asked him about Fukushima, and he was saying that that the Japanese can overcome radiation and they could solve that problem. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I'm laughing because I actually also interv I interviewed a vice finance minister uh, the summer after this, and I said, so what about the radiation and your grandchildren. And he said, oh, my grandchildren will become stronger by eating radioactive food. And I said, so you want them to be Spider-Man? I mean, I, I, no, this is nonsense. We I, know this. We, it's like, I, I'm sorry. And so Great Britain, there was some like recent development between Japan and England and England is going to import mushrooms from Japan. I, from Fukushima, I, this is all absurd. And the thing, if you'll, if your listeners will forgive me for swearing, the thing that pisses me off the most is Japan is 
the smartest country with nuclear power, and they're setting the terms for the other countries that are building nuclear power plants. So, okay, next year, Japan is going to destroy the Pacific Ocean. Japan has already destroyed farmland. It, it is just wrong. And Japan has plenty of space, Hokkaido, uh, Niigata, there's plenty of farmland for people to who live in these areas. We're talking 100,000 people, not even that many right now, who live in this farmland area, who are fisher people, who could be moved to different areas to do their jobs. And the government is just lockstep United States, nuclear power, it's fine. And that's great, but it's a problem. When there's an accident, it's real. And the U.S. government apparently is supporting the release of a mil over a million three hundred thousand tons of radioactive water with tritium on that. Oh, um, absolutely, that I would not buy sushi at your local supermarket ever again. They say it's safe. Yeah, well, they're lying straight up. <laughs> And they know that, and every Fisher person knows that. And so does the guy at Woods Hole, Massachusetts, knows that. Sorry, but I've interviewed all these people, and it's it's wrong. Now That's this, why Fisher this, people are so upset. Now, this denialism of the danger of radiation and the continued contamination in Fukushima, they, they still have not removed the uh, melted nuclear rods uh, they from can't. The, uh, they can't. And, the they, and, that, and they can't. I mean, we've got Chernobyl 101. And uh, so what is it? It's just now 2020, 2022. Um, in 2011, it was clear that this was a disaster. And uh, then all of a sudden, Japan decided it was not going to learn what Chernobyl had taught, which is to say, create a sarcophagus. And so even last week, when I was literally driving by the power plant, uh, put a sarcophagus. Don't, but, you know, in 2011, 2012, these people were saying, oh, we're going to recover the equipment. Okay, that's interesting if you're talking about like a factory fire. But it is not interesting when you're talking about something that is greater than the Chernobyl or uh, Three Mile Island disasters. So uh, we have this and uh, Japan, France, the United States, I'm trying to think the other Italy maybe uh, that have come up with robots to work on, how, I mean, which is kind of you know technologically interesting how to work on cleaning this up. Uh, all the robots have melted and like <laughs> the robots have melted nothing can be done and we're just gonna dump in the water because the water is there and you know uh that really shouldn't be the plan but it's now the plan and there's no apparently opposition by the United States, they're supporting the release There's of the no water. There's no opposition by the United States. There's a lot of opposition by Japan. There's a lot of opposition by the rest of the world. The United States, and this is where, you know, you're beginning questions. And I think the big question moving forward is what is Japan to the United States? For a long time, and I recommend the writing of Herbert Bix, Steve Rabson, People who for a long time have been called far out left-wing radicals, they're not. They're simply historians and literature professors. Um, is Japan a colony of the United States? Is it the 51st state? We talk about that sort of obliquely in academia about Puerto Rico, uh, but like I, I don't mean to sound bizarre, but the United States government is sort of like the first few weeks of Fukushima disaster, the United States broke with Japan. And that's on the record. That's the front page of the New York Times, the front page of International Herald Tribune, front page of the State Department. People were recalled, like recalled from Japan because 
the nuclear disaster was beyond levels. Then all of a sudden it was decided that, oh, okay, we need to keep Japan. And then 2012, I mean, not to get too granular here, but then all of a sudden it was decided that, oh, we need Japan to be like on our team. And so everything that is not okay environmentally or structurally has happened since. What's serious on the ground is what the farmers, the people from Fukushima have had to live with because that's all been thrown under the bus. And I just saw them a week ago and they have, you know, their lives are lost because of these decisions between governments and they're trying, but there's nothing for them. Well, you have in California, Nancy Pelosi, the head of the Democrats, uh, other uh, Congress people in California, it seems that they're not concerned. I don't know if they've been even know that this waters, contaminated waters can be, be released. And actually, uh, Congresswoman Pelosi and others are the ones supporting the remilitarization of Japan or to be an armada, an aircraft carrier against China. Um, it seems like in the United States, there is continued support for the LDP and the policies of the LDP to get rid of Article 9 and militarize and become a full nuclear power. And you're exactly right. And I wish uh, I wish Senator Pelosi and all of her colleagues would simply come to one of my classes because, or they would read one of the books I assign because uh, unfortunately, Japan is still something that is considered easy, and we don't talk about it, and we should. And another issue is the issue of denialism and the uh, comfort women and how that's part of, uh, of the Abe administration and his grandfather. Why don't we talk about denialism? I mean, we have the denialism about the danger of radiation of Fukushima, but then it goes back much further than that. Well, so it's funny you, men you mentioned that after Senator Pelosi, because I've spent the last two years being the subject of a FOIA uh, Freedom of Information Act thing at UConn, University of Connecticut, that accused me together with Senator Nancy Pelosi of trying to bring down the government of Japan. Uh, the University of Connecticut won in February, but I spent two years, I've never met Senator Pelosi. I think she's fabulous. I would love to meet Senator Pelosi and say, hey, you know, you should maybe know this about Japan. Um, and I understand supporting Japan. Uh, denialism is not okay. And that is the problem that a lot of uh, Washington has created in the last 50 years, which is to say that Japan, mm, yeah, okay, they did bad things, but they're our aircraft carrier against China and now North Korea. And the problem is that comes with a lot of lives lost to this day. So we talk about our other best ally, South Korea, and they're caught in the middle of this. So if North Korean missiles fly overhead, if China ramps up stuff around some islands, uh, South Korea is really trapped because South Koreans suffered, because there was no North and South Korea in World War II, there was Korea, and it was occupied violently by Japan. And Koreans were violently abused by Japan, whether they worked for Japanese, whether they were targeted, they were occupied. And Nancy Pelosi needs to know that in her name, um, Koreans are being targeted, actually, and uh, Japanese are denying that they abused the 20th century. And the situation of uh, Korean uh, people in Japan, Korean uh, uh, Japanese people, or Japanese Korean people in Japan who have been discriminated against, the rise of racism, xenophobia, and the effort to 
by the Japanese government, the Abe administration, to deny that there were sexual slaves or taken by the Imperial Navy. And also, they spent apparently $500 million going to consulates around the world to prevent these statues being uh, uh, I know, right? Raised. I mean, like, sorry, I'm just laughing because really, I mean, 500 million would be so helpful for so many Japanese students to go to college right now. And the same when you think about the same kind of money for American kids going to school. I mean, that as a teacher, that kind of cash, uh, Japanese people do not know that their government has spent this kind of cash. Uh, what's equally astonishing when you look at the Ivy League schools, I am extreme, I should say, I am extremely fortunate teaching at the University of Connecticut. We do not accept government money from Japan, Korea, China. I think I, I, perhaps we have some cash for the agricultural college. That's separate, but we do not take cash for political science, history. Um, all the Ivy Leagues take cash for Japanese studies. And they take five to $15 million a pop. And so I feel extremely fortunate that my students don't have to suffer from my saying the truth. Whereas my colleagues at far more powerful schools cannot talk because they would lose five to $15 million that support their graduate students. And nobody talks about this, but wow. And I learned this from a friend of mine in medical sciences. It's like, you know, if you are developing a, a drug, let's say you're developing a COVID therapy, you have to report who's giving you money. Is Pfizer giving you money as a, as a research scientist? Yes, you have to say that. If you are an academic in history, political science, literature, you don't have to report that somebody is giving you money. And I am proud to report that the University of Connecticut gets no money. So we get to do what's called history. And in, so, in that mix, uh, Nancy Pelosi has given no money, no Democrat, no Republican has given money. We simply study history. And uh, in that, um, the government of Japan has nothing to worry about. It just needs to do what it's already said it's going to do. I will also shout out the University of Connecticut here because we are one of the first schools, the only school, that did not deport Japanese Americans to concentration camps during World War II. In fact, we welcomed students of Japanese ancestry to the University of Connecticut to continue studies uh, during World War II. And you know, we take this really seriously that you are just a student. You are not a target. And unfortunately, what a lot of people don't realize is that students are targets of ideological operations. And why were you sued, or the college sued by, was it the Japanese government that sued your, you? Right, so as two white boys, <laughs> if I put it that way, uh, you have to be an American citizen to use the FOIA request. So two white guys uh, repeatedly sued the University of Connecticut uh, for my emails that Nancy Pelosi and I were trying to bring down the government of Japan. And, uh, I, you know, it's it's interesting because I honestly, I don't know whether it's COVID or whatever. I keep forgetting that happened this year, but it took two years of my life. And uh, I had five lawyers. And fortunately, the University of Connecticut paid for this, but not everybody has that privilege. And, you know, it, it is not cool to be called a liar when you're just doing your job. And they said you were trying to bring down the government of Japan? Yes, that was the, the <laughs> I think the lawsuit was like Nancy Pelosi and the University of Connecticut were trying to bring down the government of Japan. 
something like that. I can send you the details, but it was absurd and it was dismissed. And oh, the accuser did not even show up. So who were behind these people? Former Prime Minister Abe, and I have evidence for that about the cash. What is the evidence? The funding streams. So the government of Japan and Prime Minister Gov uh, Abe was involved in it's helping to sue. It, okay, so it's tricky to answer that legally. The former prime minister who's now dead funded a lobbying group that funded the white boys that were able to do the FOIAs. So they didn't like what you were saying. What, what made them so angry about you? You know, everybody asks that, and I don't have an answer because I honestly don't understand what is so upsetting to so many people about the history of what happened in the 20th century. And it seems to contradict a notion of pride. And that's why now I compare what Abe's supporters do to Steve Bannon, to January 6 supporters. I don't understand what supports hate. I just don't. And I don't, I, I just honestly don't have an answer to what supports hate. And the Japanese media now, you say, is beginning to report some of this history uh, of the relationship of the LDP and Abe government to the Moonies and these right-wing cults, they have reported in the past about the corruption scandal of Abe's wife at this church school that got land improperly and somebody, you one of the government back. officials committed suicide. Is there a connection? I don't know yet. I wrote about Mori Tomogakuen a couple of years ago. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that. I had, honestly, I had no clue about the Moonies until two weeks ago. I really didn't. And um, I was like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, and that's where, <laughs> honestly, that's where I love being a historian. Every day is a new day and you can't predict. And so, yeah, of course, it's like the Moonies kill Abe. Sure. That makes sense. Uh, the Moritomo Gakuen that Abe's wife was part of, uh, these were four-year-olds uh, who were doing Heil Hitler salutes in little sailor uniforms. And, you know, uh, okay, so that was a problem, but the, and that's, but it's kind of, you know, in really local terms, it's like Connecticut. Uh, you know, you, you don't get brought down until you do something stupid. So our former governor, Rollins, he he had so much graft, so much nepotism, but you don't get brought down in as a public official until you do something as go former Governor Rollins did, which is graft, and he had free plumbing on his lake house. So that's my comparator for Prime Minister Abe. Is like, okay, you did something really, really stupid that regular people can understand, right? We're not talking, we're, we're not talking Prince Charles. We're not talking like something the rest of us don't have a connection to. But when somebody gets free plumbing work on their house, when somebody gets a free land parcel, the rest of us who are middle class think, wait, I wanna find out why that happened. And so in Prime Minister Abe's case, uh, the free parcel of land really $200,000, $300,000 was the beginning. But there, it, Prime Minister Abe had a bunch of scandals. He had the, the land scandal. He had something called the Cherry Blossom Party, where all he did was invite these far right-wing friends for cocktails to look at blossoms. He didn't need to make that public. I mean, that could be called a dinner party, but instead he used taxpayer funds. So and that's where it's like when you think you are untouchable, you just are stupid. And I don't, you know, I don't use that term lightly, but 
Prime Minister Abe acted stupidly like a rich boy because he thought he could get away with everything. And that, again, I do not condone the violent way he died at all. Um, it is instructive that somebody who was so unhappy about these little details, a million dollars, we're talking Abe has a billion dollars in savings. But a million dollars to this kid mattered so much because his life was screwed because of what he perceived by Prime Minister Abe's family's misdirection. Details it all. And that is, so this is a middle class assassination. And that's what this is. And the Japanese government, the LDP, now say that they want to have a state funeral for former Prime Minister Abe on September the 27th. And there is growing opposition to that in Japan. Is that? That's like super interesting because I now know a whole new word it's like like there's now a whole new movement and i have friends who are making posters who are organizing protests uh no this is kishida current prime minister kishida who was appointed anointed by abe uh who is not he's what my grandparents would have called a decent republican um, that is to say, he's not a, a horrible human being, but he is lockstep because he doesn't know what to do. And Abe got assassinated and Abe appointed him. And now all of a sudden, the far right in Japan has said, we're going to do this. So he's going to do this. But the good news about Japanese people is they're really smart. And they're like, no, we're not spending money on this. So they don't actually, like, I would say that the broad conversation has nothing to do with ideology. It has to do with money. And like, we're talking about something that is not constitutional. It's pre-1945. Only emperors get this. This is wrong. And it costs a lot of money. And, uh, and for the record, Abe had a 17% support rate. He was not the most popular prime minister at all. He was the most popular prime minister for Washington because he was buying weapons. He was not the most popular prime minister for Japanese people. Washington loved him, which just to circle back to, and I hate that expression, forgive me, uh, to return to a question you asked earlier, uh, he, like, is Japan a colony of the United States? What is Japan? And so Abe, you know, bought everything Washington wanted. And was that so that he could get what he wanted, which was to exonerate his grandfather, which was wildly anti-American? Who will ever know? He's dead. And the relationship to the rise of American fascism uh, and right-wing dictators, similar to Abe. I mean, uh, in the United States now, you have a fascist movement. You had an attempted coup and insurrection. Is there a relationship of that to what is going on in Japan? A hundred percent. Steve Bannon described Abe as Trump before Trump. And uh, Abe was, you know, I mean, so Abe raced to New York to be the first person to meet Trump before he was even inaugurated. And unfortunately, and I know this is awful because Again, I do not agree with how Abe died. I don't believe in violence, but uh, the photographs of Abe and Donald Trump playing golf in Japan when Abe trips and rolls down the course are pretty funny. And at the same time, Trump whipped up racism against Asians, uh, Chinese attacking Asians and Japanese and Japanese Americans have been the victims of assaults in the United States, Asians, because of the xenophobia and, and racism whipped up by the Trump government. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, I mean, uh, it was really interesting traveling to Japan last week. I have spent half of my adult life, I mean, I first went to Japan in 1985. Um, I, um, 
have never experienced a more difficult travel that I did to get to Japan. And I'm so grateful that Japan is still Japan because everybody there still wants, I mean, Japan is the, like, it is still the leader of open, democratic, whatever that means, civil societies in Asia. And the problem with the US media is it focuses on weapons and anti-North Korea and cordon China. But Japan is a wildly open space. And we need to learn from the Japanese who are challenging Abe, especially over Kokuso, over the, the state funeral in the coming weeks. Okay, well, I wanna thank you very much. We've been talking with Professor Alexei Dudden from University of Connecticut about uh, the death of former Prime Minister Abe and the history of uh, him and his grandfather and the relationship of Abe to the United States and the US government. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. It's really good to meet you. Good. Thanks. <laughs> Very good, thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.